going on youtube i'm back finally been on uh, a lot of break been down to florida over christmas break so finally back kind of in the groove of things now well deserved and needed break so today we're going to look at uh this ele electric charging road uh didn't even know this was in the works so I don't know how I feel about it. Let me know what you think about it in the comments before we get started. Uh, just looking to learn and see what uh, see what's out there and uh, we'll kind of go through it. I am a mechanical engineer. Uh, I have my private pilot's license and I'm uh, big into 3D printing. So uh, trying to leverage some of my industry experience that I've gained throughout the few years I've been in industry and uh, from my college days as well to maybe uh, give a different point of view that somebody else has not heard of yet and uh, potentially explain something um, so the main goal is just to learn stuff and uh, have some fun along the way. So let's get started. Electric cars are increasingly staking a claim in the market, growing from just 4% of global car sales in 2020 to 14% in 2022. And with that popularity comes much needed charging infrastructure. A lack of charging infrastructure and range anxiety are among the top reasons U.S. consumers aren't buying EVs. We have definitely seen uh, charging infrastructure affecting. I would agree with that statement. Um, I know that's just talking to like, you know, my parents or folks that are older than me. That's their, well, you can only go like two, three hundred miles. Well, that's true. Um, there is a different way of looking at travel with an electric car, especially with like a Tesla when you have full self driving and you drive to the power points and really think about it. How how many times do you really travel that amount of miles um, throughout the year? I mean, you might have a couple of huge trips through the year. So you got to look at it in numbers like that. You know, are you going to travel 50% of the time long distances? Well, then maybe an EV right now isn't the car for you. So you have to look at it in those terms, not just because it's short range means it's bad. It's not, we can't look at things like that. You have to look at things kind of in a uh, more realistic approach, I guess, of, uh, what you're going to be doing with the vehicle 80-90% um, of the time. For example, the Tesla um, Semi that they're going to be released in the next year or two. Um, so it's got a 500 mile range, or at least it's gloated to be that. Uh, and I think they're shooting for, I believe it was 80%, maybe it was 90% of all um, basically semi-shipping um, travel is within 500 miles. So that's Tesla's target mark. Sure, you can get a big diesel one and go a thousand, but are you driving a thousand in a day and as a semi? Mm, probably not. Cool, you can go that. I mean, that's great. I, That's fine. But uh, for 80 to 90% of the, the country's needs uh, for trucking, uh, that would cover that. So they've uh, capitalized, they, Tesla, have capitalized on that. And I talk Tesla because I, I, my opinion, I think they're the most successful um, implementer of an EV uh, just from the vehicle um, and mainly the charging station, which was my original point pausing it here. Uh, I believe Elon said it. I mean, I'm sure everybody's kind of said it at this point, but the big, um, big thing about Tesla's is they have the charging station. So that's like a car with a, if you don't have gas stations, you're screwed. So uh, the charging station experience is important. It's kind of a whole nother part of the vehicle in a sense. So, Adoption, uh, both in terms of the availability, accessibility, and the cost. Biden's infrastructure bill allocated $7.5 billion to build out America's EV charging network. But a lot of those chargers are expected to be level two, which only gives out about 25 miles of range in an hour. Oof, that's horrible. <sighs> 25 miles an hour i've just recently kind of heard of this term like uh, a tesla charging at several hundred miles per hour um or i don't know 50 or whatever that seems very low <laughs> in comparison because you got i think tesla gen 4 chargers are, are already out uh granted they're not everywhere but they're i think at least gen 2 and 3 most of the place um so but there is another charging solution that doesn't require stopping at a station at all a road that could change the way we drive. It I'm very skeptical of this. I'll just put I'll just get that right out right now. There are so many challenges with this that I don't think outweigh the rewards. There's so many negatives. I don't think there's enough positives to make it worth it. So, let me know what you think in the comments below. We'll see how it we'll see how it goes here. It's powering and charging this electric bus on the go wirelessly. 
a process where roads are connected to the grid, allowing EVs to wirelessly receive a charge while driving over electricity transmitters. Sweden, which has become a world leader in the realm of electrified roads, already having taken part in four pilots, has plans to construct the world's first permanent electrified road. And the first electric road in the U.S. is interesting. Hmm. expected to be tested in Detroit, Michigan within a year. The inductive charging project is looking at a system and implementation um, for electrification in vehicles. Oh, that's where the uh, 3D printing uh, rapid TCT was at. I went there a couple years ago. Interesting. Is looking at a system and implementation um, for electrification in vehicles on our infrastructure. So how can you know we take and look at different capabilities of charging infrastructure, whether it's plug-in plug charging or um, inductive charging, such as this project, and create a cohesive environment for people CNBC explores how electrified roads work and whether they'll become a widely adopted charging solution for EVs. My general assumption here is it's basically just a, you know, you take your phone and you put that on your charging pad, blink, and you just have a bunch of charging pads lined up in a row. We'll see. My initial skepticisms of this is A, how fast can you actually drive with it? In is there a limit to the speed um, at which you can drive over it to get a charge? A. B, I'm from northern Indiana. This is Detroit, which is even farther north. Our roads are dog crap most of the time because of winter. You get a crack in the road, water seeps in, freezes, pops up the uh, road, and then... It's just a bumpy mess. So, okay, road maintenance. You know, how expensive is it to fix this type of road? Is it, you know, something that's buried deep down that you just have to resurface? Um, you know, what does that look like? That seems like that would be expensive. Right now, and my, my assumptions, I feel like it would be more worth investing in better charging stations rather than this. But we'll see. Electrified roads work a lot like the wireless charging that's in most smartphones. There we go. With a transmitter coil in a phone and a wireless charger, a magnetic field is created in between, allowing the phone to receive between 10 and 15 watts of energy without any physical connection. Now multiply that amount of power by about... That's how I charge mine. I have the iPhone, so the MagSafe on the iPhone 14. Um, I love it. It just snaps right to it, and it gets a little warm on the back side of it, but I like it. 30,000 bury the coils under 30,000 watts I don't feel like people understand how powerful that is I can I understand it mainly due to my 3d printer that I built uh, as a tool changer and the heated bed is 1200 watts so that's basically 10 amps and a typical house circuit in America is uh, rated for 15 amps before the uh, breaker is gonna shut off um, 30,000 watts. That's just a lot of a lot of juice. I, I don't know a great way to quantify that to someone who can't really understand what that equates to. Basically like 30 micro... No. Yeah, it'd be like 30 microwaves if they're 1,000 watts each. I don't even know if... I think microwaves are about 1,000 watts. You can get them in varying different sizes, but that's a lot of wattage. They're about four inches of pavement a wireless receiver to an EV and you have a working dynamic electrified road. I know from, uh, oh, this might be, yeah, so this pad right here, I know a couple guys at work have uh, Teslas and one of them was talking to me about that Tesla um, teased a, basically a pad you can drive over in your garage so you don't even have to plug it in in your garage. Um, so curious to see what the efficiency is on that. EVs don't currently have receivers allowing a wireless charge, but it's relatively cheap and easy to add. And manufacturers could start to integrate this technology in the future. This approach is really um, a, a approach that can charge vehicles in any type of shape, meaning vehicles that are buses or vans or passenger cars or trucks, but it can also charge a vehicle while either driving or while standing still. For a phone to charge wirelessly, the coils have to be almost perfectly aligned for it to work. That, that was my other thing, is it could be mitigated a bit from, um, 
which uh, like full self driving on Teslas, where they're you're you know you're pretty aligned with the road, um, but at the same time, how do you how do you address that deviation? You know. <laughs> I don't know. There just seems like a lot of challenges with it for but me. With an electrified road, the technology allows for more leniency, so precise alignment okay. of the coils isn't necessary. Interesting. Wonder what's different. So you have a higher tolerance of moving on the road, on having an air gap that's tolerable, that makes it practical for using in everyday operations for for cars. So it is much more of an efficient system, I would say, an optimal system compared to the phone charger, which is more simplistic. These systems typically connect to the electrical grid. However, electrified roads can also be hooked up to battery hubs connected to solar panels or other sources of clean energy, which would make the process greener and allow for electric roads in disconnected areas like on an interstate highway. And that's where we see a lot of the benefits as well, both in terms of the environment, but also in terms of economic development. And that would definitely also release some of the pressure on the grid. Right now, so kind of back to the beginning where I had mentioned, um, you get people saying, Oh, the Tosa semi can't pull it very far, you know, 400, 500 miles. Well, and then how it went over, how it could cover, you know, that covers maybe 80, 90 percent of all the delivery routes. Um, I guess I could potentially see a way that if this is just in downtown cities, like they had, I think, in one of these screenshots. I don't know where it's at. It was a view of the city. Well, I mean, we can just take this for example. If all your like New York City, we'll just pull New York City out for that. Uh, for that, with all the traffic that's maybe doesn't go above thirty-five miles an hour or is sitting a lot in traffic, this could potentially be something that would maybe be more more practical for that situation. Driving on the highway at eighty, probably not. Areas, like it does mean all percent of American roads are in pressure on the grid. Right now, an estimated 43% of American roads are in mediocre or poor condition. I would agree with that, <laughs> especially in the more northern states. And one report showed there's over $750 billion worth of backlogged road and bridge repairs. Some view this as the perfect chance to innovate. As we rehabilitate a lot of the infrastructure, uh, we know the conditions of, of our assets here in the U.S. It's an opportunity to... I don't think that we have that much backlogged, but putting an electric road in is probably going to take uh, two or three times as long. Because <laughs> now you got power you got to bury. you got all that other special stuff you got to put in. Roads take long enough to create. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. I really think about this technology and it would be much more cost effective to be able to install and implement this as we, as I said, do more major rehabilitation of interstate highways, tollways, and so forth. Electrifying roads would only add to the hefty price of road repair and maintenance. Yep. Electrion, one company leading the charge on electrified road technology, estimated that at a high production volume, the cost to electrify a mile of road would be about $1.2 million. <laughs> One point two million dollars for a one mile. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh gotta start somewhere I guess, but that is a lot of dough. And then the government will be like, Oh, we'll just pay for it, which means we get to pay for it through our taxes. Oh, we're upgrading your taxes. Mm-hmm. While reconstruction costs per mile of a road can already cost anywhere between 1.5 to 11 million dollars depending on condition. Okay, well maybe that's not so bad. And population density. Sweden is one of the pioneers implementing this technology in an attempt to reduce the nation's impact on the environment. It has already piloted four unique electrified road projects, testing out different electricity conduction techniques. We have kind of tough climate goals in Sweden. That is, we have to reduce uh, our carbon footprint 70%. If you look at how it looked at 2015-14 uh, there, uh, the battery capacity wasn't like it is now. So for the heavy transport, uh, we have to look into other solutions. So, so and that was why we were into Eros. And now the EU will require all new cars in member states to be electric starting in 2035, adding pressure to improve EV infrastructure. Sweden is also testing out how... 
I don't know. I'm I'm not super on board with all this <laughs> climate alarmism, we'll call it. Um, but that's just I don't know. Forcing stuff like that. I mean, I get it. It can force some innovation, but at the same time, that's I I think there's a lot of controversy of the environmental impact of just creating the batteries versus a regular combustion engine. Um, so I don't know. I'm kind of, kind of in the middle between those, both of those issues. Um, I see the benefits of electric vehicles, of from just a mechanical perspective of less parts, especially from the motor. I mean, you probably have, you got all those pistons, rods, valves, lifters, you know, you got chain time, timing chain stuff. You got all that stuff moving and they're only about 30% efficient. Otherwise the rest is just heat more or less and then you got the the electric and then you don't recoup any of that when you're slowing down where you have the electric recouping that um overall efficiency of the electric i don't really know what that is um that'd be something would be cool to look into but i feel like there's barring the negative effects of the battery creation that aside i think evs are more efficient in that regard in fact, I, I think it's gotta be, I don't, I can't say for certain, but it, just my gut feeling is they are. Um, and it, and it's the other thing too. It's like, it doesn't mean that we have to all push to that and that EVs are the right, are the only thing for the job. Like I said, you're not gonna, for example, like planes, we're not going to make planes all EV because of energy, energy density. There's it. There's other things that we have to look at before we get to that. Um, for planes, um, really long trips for trucks, I mean, that's just going to have to be diesel or whatever for now. Diesel is the most efficient relative to gas and big trucks like that because of the BTU output. But it's just this argument of, oh, we got to go all EVs. It's like, no, I don't think we necessarily need to. I think there's a, a, a balance, a middle ground. I think a good example of this is like the Amazon delivery vans. Um, we're going through a city, maybe you only need a hundred and some odd, I think they're about 130, 150 miles of range. Not a whole lot, but if you're going down, I'm in Fort Wayne, so I'm, I'm the second largest city in Indiana. And you know, you got Amazon delivery vans, they come on, park, they're idling for a minute or two till they figure out their next place and they're dropping off. You know, that that's waste. Um, not even just from an environment, but just from an energy perspective, uh, looking at it purely mechanically. Whereas you have an electric, you just pull up, sit there, and it's, you know, just running maybe the HVAC system and the display screen more or less, you know. So there's efficiencies that can be gained in in those regards, and that's where I look to for the innovation. Um, so, I don't know, just my thoughts on it. How well this infrastructure holds up to extreme cold weather? If you build something in the road, we also have to consider uh, that we have frozen roads in, in, in Sweden. And the challenges with that so that we are actually testing that right now but so far it, it seems to be okay one of the world's first permanent so far it seems to be okay okay not sure what that means i guess it's working okay i don't know if there's any kind of losses associated with that it seems like a fairly generic statement electrified roads will be built on european route e20 located between three major swedish cities but plans have been delayed due to the high cost Electron has several pilot programs in operation, including projects in Israel, Norway, and Italy, among others. Not going to be going on in Israel right now. Probably not. One project in Sweden which connects the airport to the town of Visby cost about $10.5 million and was almost entirely financed by the Swedish Transport Administration. Which is probably by the taxes. It also has some commercial programs in the works, like its bus project running in Berlin, in Germany. Once all stages of the project are complete, it will have two static charging stations and one kilometer of dynamic charging, which adds an estimated two to four kilometers of range to the battery. Electrion is also working with the state of Michigan to pilot a dynamic electrified road in Detroit within the next year. I just don't know why they picked Michigan. <laughs> Detroit, I get it, the whole legacy of creating cars and everything, but man, their roads... You're going to have to redo them all the time. It's like the worst state for potholes. <laughs> Which would be the first in the U.S. The project costs about $6 million, with the Michigan DOT spending about $1.9 million and Electron covering the rest. The first location is in the city of Detroit on 14th Street. We have two static charging pads that will be installed in that area. 
So that's an area where um, the shuttle can pull up on, last mile delivery, trucks can pull up there while they're making their delivery. I think the charging pads uh, as like a parallel parking spot could be a good idea, definitely. Um, that's interesting. Delivery, they can be- It would take out uh, clutter along maybe a sidewalk or whatever. Uh, I could see that as, I mean, it's not gonna be obviously as efficient as a wired charge, but if you're there for half the day, then me. Eh probably don't matter but I don't know that's interesting though a charge um, and then we have about a quarter of a mile on 14th Street that will be installed in the pavement that will be for in motion charging and then in 2024 that's what it looks like in Detroit about six to eight months out of the year or we'll be installing on Michigan Avenue as part of a road reconstruct project of about three quarters of a mile as part of this pilot program they're studying how this technology could later be implemented in Michigan at a larger scale Still wondering what the uh, velocity impact is on this. What's your limit of how fast you can go? We really are looking hard within this pilot project to look at the different use cases that are out there. There's use cases for freight, um, transit, but then also passenger vehicles. I can see that for buses that do routine routes through the city every day, like I talked about earlier with uh, in-city roads where they're not going very fast and it's a common route. I could. I could see that potentially, uh, just all depends on cost basically. But even if the pilot proves successful, it could still be some time before you start to see electrified roads used more widely in the US. Because then every vehicle has to have that extra add-on now. Okay, well how much is that? I don't know. Ramping it up is a little more difficult with inductive charging because of the infrastructure impacts. So it does go under the pavement surface. So you'd have to rip up the road to install it, and then probably about three years later, <laughs> fix the road again because it's so chopped up. So we have to look at the use cases, right, that we've identified. We're not going to go, you know, redo every road in the state of Michigan, you know, to put this charging in, but looking at a sustainable plan forward of how that implementation would be in those key areas where our citizens in Michigan would get the benefit. A typical city bus in the U.S. gets only 3.4 miles per gallon with a fuel tank that holds about 125 gallons of gasoline. Yeah. That means a diesel bus can go over 400 miles without needing a refill. And an electric bus's range can sometimes max out at 150 miles. Ouch. Not to mention the hours it'll need to recharge. Many of these fleet vehicles are essentially driving without stopping, meaning batteries will be drained. Fat. These are the Amazon vans I was talking about. I believe Rivian makes these. I haven't seen any in Fort Wayne yet. But I have seen them, I was just in Florida, Sarasota. I saw one in Sarasota like a week ago. Operate. That's a Florida license plate, coincidentally. Getting repetitively for long hours, needing huge batteries, a lot of tons of batteries, like maybe eight tons more. And that costs a lot of money and it takes, it, it's heavy for the roads. In addition to dynamic charging, companies like Electrion are also creating static chargers, a technology it's thinking could be perfect for buses, as it halts at each stop, even if it's just for 30 seconds. It True. I mean, every bus stop is there for a minute, two minutes. That's interesting. There are some good ideas in there and here and kind of coming around to them, but still a bit uh, reserved in some respects. Could harness enough electricity. I guess I'm curious to see how much it actually produces need to keep going throughout the day and I've kind of withheld that it seems like and it's pretty f fantastic because that bus doesn't need to go now suddenly in charge overnight at the depot so you can you know extend the, the, the operations of the bus you can limit the the load at the at the depot when all the buses need the buses too you got um, regen so when you're slowing down of course you're not going super fast but you could do this at airports um, yeah to charge one of electron's case studies in israel is a bus line that includes 700 meters of electrified roads and a static charger at the bus terminal while the ev market is growing at rapid rates charging infrastructure is inherently needed to support that growth there were about 87,000 electric vehicle charging ports in the u.s in 2019 now there's over 160,000 nationwide nearly doubling in just three years but studies show the U.S. needs eight times more charging stations by 2030 to handle the coming wave of EVs. But right now, the vast majority of working electrified road projects are temporary, either case studies or pilots. 
the important thing is that the technology is here. It, it's there for commercial use and deployment. And so we're working with the right entity to first do these pilots where you get all the, the ecosystem together from the vehicles, from the road construction, from the public authorities and getting the permits and, and all these things and, and the use cases. And so once we put that in together, then you now enable a platform to grow in, in the state, in the city, in, in, in the country. It would also be extremely costly to electrify every road. So while it likely won't be a regular road replacement, it could fit well in certain target areas like exit ramps, intersections, and high traffic streets. We don't view 100% of roads being electrified, but we definitely see this technology being viable, uh, both financially and also essential uh, in rural areas where we might not have uh, a lot of uh, charging stations or we have what we call uh, charging deserts. I expect that we'll have focus on certain regions where this is widely adopted in a city uh, for commercial fleets. And I think in 10 years, I, I see, foresee a scenario where we also have intercity roads between regions that have electric corridors Hmm. So it's pretty much like those um, <laughs> electric cars, little task cars. We had one of these tracks when I was a kid. You had to like the little uh, speed controller and <laughs> go around. That was a lot of fun. That's basically what we're making more or less. Uh, I don't know. Interesting. Learned a lot. Learned, um, I guess, how it works, what their plans are. Um, I am curious to see what the uh, ramifications for speed are. Um, I assume it's going to be slow. Uh, they didn't say anything about it, but I think the faster you would go, the the more that would hinder its ability to charge, but it could be wrong. I don't know. So interesting. Um, let me know what you guys think below, uh, what you think of the charging, the way it's implemented here, what you would do differently. Um, yeah, let me know what you think. And, uh, if you got a video you want me to react to next drop that link down below and i'll check it out and uh yeah glad you guys uh came along with me hopefully you enjoyed it and learned something today too as well if you wouldn't mind hitting the subscribe that'd mean a lot to me help grow the channel and reach a wider audience i'd greatly appreciate that and uh yeah catch you next time peace